out of your mind? But Here's the debate. You're upset. They're saying we believe you. Is it? I thought the... Uh, We're live. Episode number 149 with the great Rick Massey. And if you don't know who he is, if you've watched the movie King Richard, King Richard went to Rick Massey and said, you need to come to Compton to meet my kids. It was played by John Bernthal, which I believe it was 225 people that went and uh, auditioned for that role to play you. And he was the one that won it. And some stats that you need to know about eight Grand Slam champions, have been coached by him. Five players ranked first place. 322 USTA National Championships. 52 Grand Slam Championship wins. Seven-time USPTA Coach of the Year. Four Hall of Fame inductees. And in 2017, he was the youngest ever to be inducted into the USPTA Hall of Fame. Andy Roddick, he coached. Jennifer Capriati, he coached. Maria Sharapova, which he may ask for a number, he coached. Serena Williams, he coached. Venus Williams, he coached. And uh, some people may be watching and say, Pat, this is... I mean, what are you doing talking tennis? Let me tell you why I'm talking tennis. I got four kids, and my kids play sports, and my dad's obsessed with tennis, oh, and yeah. I watched this movie, and I said, dude, I want to talk to this man, so thank you so much for making the time for being on the podcast. No, I'm glad to be here. I'm fired up and ready to go. Yes, I mean, right when the camera was on, Adam's like, turn on the camera, we got to go live. He's on fire. So, first of all, uh, you know, for, for folks, uh, uh, I mean, at this point of the game, most people know your story from the movie, right? They, they know you from the movie, but how did you get into the tennis world? How did this happen all the way down to... When the movie happened and you're seeing yourself on the big screen, what does it feel like seeing John play you? So walk us through that story. Well, let's let's go back down the yellow brick road. You know, when I was uh, I was born in Greenville, Ohio, a small town southwest of Dayton. Uh, my dad died when I was ten. We I used to play golf. I was very good in golf, and there was tennis courts like a half mile from my house. I went down there one day because we couldn't afford to go to the country club anymore. I picked up a racket. I started hitting the ball against the wall. I really liked it because it always came back, and uh, I was a pretty competitive guy. Um, to fast forward, uh, by 18, I was number one in the Ohio Valley. Uh, I got really good real quick. I played basketball uh, in the Hall of Fame for basketball and tennis my hometown. Wow. Um, dabbled a little bit on the satellite, but I knew at a young age uh, I liked helping other people more than I liked helping myself. So I got into coaching when I was like 22. Um as time went on, I said, if I really want to go for this, I got to go to California or Florida. Early 80s, I went to a place called Greenleaf Golf and Tennis Resort in Haines City, Florida. Um, was there for a while. And then in 1985, a doctor from Winter Haven, Florida, brought his son to me, a nine-year-old boy named Tommy Ho. Uh, he held the racket like a, a ping-pong paddle. He had a really funny grip, but I saw a lot of potential. To fast forward that story, he became the most dominant junior tennis player ever. Yeah. Uh, he won Kalamazoo at 15 years old mm -hmm. as an 18-year-old in 1988. The youngest, uh, that record still stands today. He won more gold balls in Sampers, Agassi, Chang than anybody. And from his success, a guy named Stefano Capriotti brought Jennifer to me, who lived right here in Lauder Hill, said, I want to teach my daughter how to serve. She kind of served like Chris Everett. She was kind of a Chrissy clone, which is not bad, especially mentally. Um, Jennifer won the 18s as a 12-year-old when I had her. That record what? still stands today. That's, won the 18s that's, at that, 12 that's years old. That's brutal. That doesn't happen now because— that's psychological. No. I mean, you got to be like, how do you lose to a 12-year-old recovered from it mentally? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, when you're she, 18, a senior in high school, you lose to a— Yeah, I know. She probably retired a lot of people no, that had big seriously, dreams. Yeah. But, you know, but I had the Daily Double in 1988. Yeah. Those records still stand today. So from that, a um, couple years later, I get a phone call from this guy named Richard Williams. And he said, I have two daughters. I heard of them in the New York Times. I guess Venus was undefeated in the 10 and under. And he goes, really funny guy. He, the only thing I knew about Compton was like riots and that type mm -hmm, of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he goes, if you come to Compton, I promise I won't get you shot. Okay. <laughs> and I, I thought the guy was hilarious. And I never go see someone. They either right. come to the academy right. or I see him at a junior tournament. So I just figured I'll take a shot. So 
Obviously, it's the best vacation I ever took going to Compton, California. So I go to Compton. I flew out there one weekend in May, right before summer. And it was just like yesterday. You know, they that night, Venus, Serena, Richard, Orsine come to the hotel. Venus on one leg, Serena on the other, hugging, kissing, close-knit family, just like you see in that movie. Richard pulls out a piece of paper. Uh, he grilled me like I was in a deposition. You know, I thought like, well, if he wanted someone in their circle, he wanted a role model, a father figure, and someone who's been there, done that. So I didn't, I wasn't defensive about it. I kind of respected that he was taking the temperature. So he said, we're picking you up tomorrow at seven o'clock. That bus you see in the movie. Okay. So at seven o'clock, they pick me up. I get in the passenger side. I get harpooned in the buttock. There's a spring sticking up. I look in back. You got Venus and Serena back there. There's McDonald's wrappers. There's four months worth of garbage. There's ball hoppers. It was crazy. It was like, it was like I was in a movie. Now remember, I'm at a five star resort. Now I hear I'm in Compton. I'm in this bus that's wobbling around. He goes, "We're going to East Compton Hills Country Club." So we go, and about ten minutes into the ride, I'm looking around and I'm going. This is a strange place for a country <laughs> club. We pull up to a park. We get out. There's about 20 guys shooting hoops. There's people smoking. There's people drinking. There's people passed out. We get out. Now, listen to this. It's 1991, all right? They go, hey, Richard. Hey, King Richard. They called the guy King then. We had to go across because they knew who he was, hmm. and they knew who the girls were. They go, hey, VW. Hey, Meek. Serena's middle name is Serena Jamika Williams. So we go across the basketball court. It parts like the Red Sea, like these kids are celebrity. And they're two little hamburgers at nine and 10 years old, you know? So we go across the basketball court onto the court. I had a box of Wilson balls shipped there. And he goes, Rick, 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 we, we don't use new balls. I want old balls. I want them digging. I want them bending, you know, digging out the balls. I got it. It was a little different. So now we go onto the tennis court. Me and you wouldn't even play on the court. Okay, there was a shopping cart attached to the net post, the same shopping cart you see in that mo in the movie. Richard had like seven chains wrapped around it. He looks at me, goes, Rick, I got to secure it. It won't be here in the morning. So it took him 20 minutes to get the cart ready, puts the old balls in. So I start drilling Venus and Serena. Now, remember, I had Jennifer Capriotti. Now, she was already 14, top 10 in the world. Mm -hmm. She was already on the pro tour. Mm -hmm. So my blueprint for greatness was probably more than anybody in the world. Yeah. So she had her racket back in the parking lot, low center of gravity, great fundamentals by the late, great Jimmy Everett. So now I'm out there with Venus and Serena, arms, legs, hair, beads flying off their head. I'm going, what in God's name am I doing in Compton, California? They were maybe 70, 80 in the nation, which I see that all the time. So after about an hour, it's a great lesson for anybody, any parent, coach, or Rick Macy, okay? You don't judge a book by the cover. The cover could be terrible, the book amazing, okay? The cover amazing, the book great. So you got to understand, now I said, let's play competitive points, and the whole landscape changed. When I said game on, the footwork got better. They were popping the popcorn, extra butter. The preparation got better. The burning desire there was, there was a rage inside these two little girls. The burning desire love to get to the ball was brutal. Wow. And now listen, I have, listen, I've told so many people, and I have a lot of kids that try hard. This was different. There was something inside of them, even though it was a train wreck on the outside. And when I saw they ran so hard, and now I'm projecting in my head, 5'10", 145, 6 feet, a buck 60, you know, I'm thinking where this is going to go. And I, right then and there, I, Richard, come here. And this is in the movie. I said, and it was more about Venus because she was a little more mature. Serena was like a little prankster. She was nine. I go, you got the next female Michael Jordan on your hand. And he puts his arm around me. He goes, no, brother, man, I got the next two. <laughs> That's and, a and good scene in the movie, by no, the no. way. And so, but wait, so then Venus goes, daddy, can I go to the bathroom? Okay, they're hugging, kissing, close knit family, just like you see in the movie. Okay, they were just like bang, they were like that. Venus goes out the gate, 
walks on her hands for five feet, does backward cartwheels for five feet. And then I'm going, whoa, whoa, whoa. So remember, this was 1991. If you were big and strong in women's tennis, you weren't really nimble. So now I'm thinking, not only can these kids be number one in the world with the right coaching and financial backing, they can they can change everything because they can transcend the sport. They were going to bring a different athlete. You knew this when you saw that. But I didn't. But the moral of the story, yeah. okay, the moral of the story is I didn't see it on the outside. It's what I saw on the inside, why I took the chance, all the sweat equity, millions of dollars, and I rolled the dice because everybody thought I was crazy. And I get that question a lot now. Why would I do it? That's what I tell people all the time. What you may see is very different than Rick may see. <laughs> what you okay. may see is very different than what Rick may see. You what play a the freaking name. line. That's awesome. <laughs> you said you had to invest <clears throat> millions of dollars. Is that what you just said? Yeah. No. Yeah. Listen, um, I probably put four to five hours a day of me one-on-one. -on -one. There was hitting partners, ballet, boxing, taekwondo, uh, Disney tickets, you know, a house, $92,000 motor home. So you got to understand, I took on the whole family. You were funding all that, you're saying? Yeah, you know, I'm not IMG. I'm not a billion-dollar right. corporation. But I believed in a couple things. I believed in Venus, mm -hmm. Serena, Richard, and most of all, myself. Whether this took four years, eight years, I knew this was different. You got to remember, I had Capriati, and I, right. I, I just knew... But I knew a lot of work had to be done, you know, technically. But at the end of the day, everybody wants to know now, especially after the movie, why did I take a chance? Because I had to take the I had to take the whole family and move mm -hmm. them here. So, but it wasn't a risk because my mom always told me, if you're going to bet, bet on one thing, yourself. And I don't bet. And the only thing I really ever bet on mm -hmm. was Venus and Serena. And the best trip I ever made in my life was going to Compton, California. Now, what role did the mother play? Huge. Okay. She was silent, but deadly. When she spoke, okay, uh, she got everybody's attention. So she wasn't as involved, like, on the court and stuff like that. But off the court, um, you got to remember, the reason why Venus and Serena, they, they were like my own daughters. And Richard was my best friend. And even though, if you see the movie, So Stubborn... And I'm, I tell people, I should be in the Hall of Fame just putting up with that guy for four years, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was, it, but it was because a world-class dad, okay? The life lessons that he taught these kids and the mother every single night, and I don't see that nowadays, every single night after the lessons, after the training, whether it's good, bad, happy, or sad, Rick, thank you very much. C crazy. And every day they brought their books to the court. If it rained, go to Rick's office and study. These are the things that people don't know. So what he did as a father every day, okay, he was taking these girls home at night at 10 and 11. Now, you you got to make sure you have the goods if you go this. He was like out there. He would interview them, on a, on a, put up his tripod. He'd be asking them questions at 10 and 11, preparing them for the future of how to answer the question without answering the question. Because remember, you're two little African-American girls going in a predominantly white sport, and people are saying you're legendary. Yeah. Then you got Rick Macy saying you're going to be better in Capriati. So this took nuclear proportions because we're talking NBC, ABC. It, this was They got more press than people number one in the world on the Pro Tour before it even happened. Okay, and he, But that started at birth. The, that was baked in extra crispy how mentally strong they were before I met them. But he was teaching them life lessons all the time and left the heavy lifting to me. Now, let me ask you this. So, so during that time when everything's going on and then the movie comes out, and then when the movie comes out, you see what happens with Will Smith winning the Academy and all that stuff that takes place with the slapping. And then you said something off camera about, about Will, if you're comfortable sharing. Give, give me the perspective from the movie coming out to then Will winning Oscar, to then the incident that took place. What did that do to the whole story? Well, first off, that's a great question. When I went to the red carpet and the after party, and I met Will, 
and it was it was kind of interesting. He was more excited to meet me than me to meet him. It was kind of a weird dynamic because you got to remember when you're a character and you're into someone that deep, okay? And I, I didn't really understand that because that's not my world, okay? Um, no one had a better front row seat than Rick Macy other than maybe the wife because I was there every day, five hours a day, six days a week. That doesn't sound like a lot. But you go 365 days a year for four years, there's a lot of crap that could go on and blow the whole thing up. So I'm there every day, and that's why that's why I love Richard, even though he was out there on a lot of stuff. So Will got so into the character. When I saw the movie, when we had the screening in mm-hmm, Boca, mm-hmm. it blew me away. The, the subtleties, the nuances, the walk, the talk, the, idi- the idiosyncrasies, it took him two hours just to put on how he had to look like Richard. It, it was beyond Richard. And this is what I've told other people when I spoke to him. So, and you got to remember this happened during the pandemic. So this guy was probably going into the shopping mall. He was probably going home talking to his kids like that. He became Richard. And there was one scene in the movie where, uh, it was in my office in 1994 before Venus was going to make her debut, mm-hmm. all right? And I don't know, it was day one or some TV show. And the guy asked Venus, do you think you can win? And Venus goes, I know I can. And then the guy pressed her, you say that so confidently. And Venus goes, I am confident. And then she, the guy goes, why are you confident? And she, go, he, she goes, because I am. And then Richard blew a gasket. He comes running onto the set, okay, and just tortures the guy. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God. You know, what do you mean? Did he assault him? Did no, he no, him? no. No, he okay. didn't assault him, but he got that far from his face. He got up in his grill. He got in his grill, just said, listen, leave her alone. She's a little, you know, a little black girl. You know, your your, your ass is going to be in the ground. Oh, you know, she. he just, he blew a gasket. Richard was so protective of those girls, okay? And Will even made reference of that. When he saw that yeah. in 94, it will brought that up, but I'm sure that was discussed a lot during the movie. So now you go through the movie and the minute I saw it, I've told other people he's going to win an Oscar, even though I don't know how that stuff works. In my opinion, he was going to get an Oscar. So now when he's at the Oscar, that reaction was beyond bizarre. That doesn't mean I'm justifying it, but something inside of him made him do that because looking back i'm sure he wished he wouldn't have done it because the ripples worsen now the action but maybe the guy thought he was richard williams so that's very very that's my take on it it doesn't justify he has to own it but at the end of the day uh it was bizarre when he did that when when he got up on stage i know not that you're a you know psychiatrist or doctor or anything like that but you have a front row seat to all this right yeah Richard Williams, Venus, Serena, Will Smith. You're, I saw you on the red carpet with John Bernthal. When he went up there and slapped Chris Rock, what percentage of that was he was in the Richard Williams character moment, still in it? And then what percentage was the everything that's been he's been dealing with in his own personal life with Jada? Is it a cumulative effect? I mean, you said that he was basically becoming this guy, Richard Williams. What's your analysis? Yeah, you know, I, another great question. I think a lot of it is is Richard, because initially he laughed. I just think that Mm -hmm. he wasn't even thinking. I mean, it was just Richard. I know it's hard for people on the outside to look at like that, you know, but they become these people. And uh, he even kind of said that when he was given his speech. 100% said that. The crazy father. and But people aren't going to say, you know, that's justified. But I could see that because that was out of character to do something like that. Mm-hmm. At that moment, when he's at the pinnacle, because he's done a lot of great yeah. things in movies. What do you think, Pat? Well, you ever seen the the moment when the, uh, Jack Nicholson's having dinner? Uh, Jack Nicholas. Which one's the actor? Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson's <laughs> having dinner. Okay. Yeah. He comes out of a restaurant, and a reporter comes up and he says, Hey, Jack, did you hear about what happened to Heath Ledger? What happened to him? He just he was found dead. Mm. He says, What? He says, Yes. Do you remember what his next line is? No, because they were both the Joker. He says, I told him never to play Joker. Shit. You never seen this? I got the I chills. recall I've it, yeah. This. He says, I told him to never play the Joker. 
Now, there's a part of that on what you're saying that I can agree with. Because if you're playing a role that long mm -hmm. for that much, I can see how you can take... A, Method a, actor. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can see how you can take that and become that. Like, you know, they say Daniel Day-Lewis is one of oh, the greatest yeah. actors of all time because of the way even... Uh, what's his name talked about it? Ethan Suplee talked about it last week where, you know, he gets into it Leo. so much. Yeah, that's like he's just a, fully a part of it, yeah. right? And he just... You don't even know who you are. You leave. Daniel Day-Lewis, when he played the last set of Mohicans, you know he went out there and lived out there to know what it oh, feels like. Oh, he gets like. in it. Oh, he gets in it. When he was the butcher way. in yeah. uh, <clears throat> was it the town or Five Towns? Well, or? maybe he should have skipped. The, uh, maybe Will should have skipped going to the Oscars that day because yeah, that slap but, changed But one more yeah. point. A lot of you know, things, yeah. it's different. Like, if you're in a movie and you're an actor, that's one thing. But remember, he was playing a person. This is a bio. That's that's a little different than just acting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he was... And a live person, too. Well, there yes, is a difference. There, there's, there's, a zero, yeah, there's zero excuses for his behavior. Zero, zero excuses no, zero. for his behavior. So there's no way, you know, that's kind of like uh, saying a professional athlete who is super, super, super competitive goes and slaps like Latrell Sprewell, uh, Sprewell mm -hmm. what he did to his coach. I don't remember that. When he coached his cho uh, 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 choked yeah. his coach. And, uh, you know, or some of the other stories you hear about uh, Rudy Tomjanovich years ago running the other guy knocks him and you remember the whole oh, thing the, yeah, story? The yeah. center of court yeah. yeah center of court so there's no was excuse that Larry for Bird it. who did that no not Larry Bird Larry Bird got oh, maybe that was Julius Dr. J Irving. Dr. Yeah. J punched Larry a yeah, exactly. few yeah. times where Moses Malone was crazy. holding him back but that's a completely different but do you think the backlash against Will is actually justified to the point where what he did was that bad yes we agree not a good thing yeah. to do yeah but he didn't beat the crap out of somebody he didn't murder somebody he slapped another man so you know, they're talking. Will get, Will's getting canceled. Yeah. Never again. It's like this was the like the the biggest just Hollywood blockbuster star out there. I get it, but do you think it's overblown? I think it's a culmination. I don't think it's just one thing. I think it's a culmination of a lot of different things he's dealing with. I think it's fifty, eighty percent of stuff that we don't know about, and it's mm -hmm. twenty percent of stuff that we know about. The eighty percent of stuff that we don't know about, we're all yeah. speculating. You know, just what we did a couple of days ago with the mm -hmm. whole shirt free will, yeah. the campaign that we put together that. Uh, uh, but anyways, going back to this with... You know what it is, by the way? What? There's certain things that we may see, and there's certain things that Rick may see. Yeah, that's right. Well, I think it's a... Me <laughs> I, no, I, that's a good one. Uh, I should use that. I, it's a medley of stuff. If he'd have done that on the street, it's no big deal. But because he did it in that backdrop, yes. and you know they, they have to do something... Even if it's just to do something, that's what that's what's bad about the whole thing. They just have to react. They can't yeah. just say, "Don't worry about it, bro." You know, it's okay. Uh, stay. They had to do something. It's kind of like the Johnny Depp story, right? Oh, you know, the Johnny Depp story that's going through. Uh, you know, with uh, what's the Amber, Amber Heard. Heard ride that they're going through? I don't know if you're following the story or not with the two of them that they're. Well, going he's through. Hollywood these days. Yeah. He's on no, the red carpet. He, no, how can he not? Yes. No, I'm on the court. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to stay on the court. Yeah, that's okay. my wheelhouse. But but this whole story that's going on and. All these videos become in, uh, what do you call it? All these videos become in, like, the recordings that they're talking about. And, you know, everything is public. I don't they're even like it. I don't even like yeah. the fact that. So so you guys chose to do the Epstein case, and you did that private, but you're doing this public? Like, it should be the other way around. That won't affect people's lives. This is between two people. Leave them alone, and they're getting embarrassed publicly. And the recording you're, you're hearing about, you don't know what people are really dealing with. Johnny Depp, one guy said something. He said, uh, uh. In the last 50 years, there's not one story of Johnny ever raising his hands on anybody, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, Will Smith, the last, I don't know, 30 years, there's not one story of Will no. doing what he just did. And Will's played a lot of different roles. He's played Ali. He's, He's beat the shit out of people. Yeah. I mean, he literally could have come out and said, well, I felt like I was Ali for a minute. And I, you yeah. know. So, but the point he's is, going there has to be, he's going through a lot. So that's a completely different conversation. Yeah. That we're having. But let me come back to you with, with King Richard and the coaching. So, uh, you know, I rented out a uh, room in, at the Breakers Hotel, okay, which you know where Breakers is at. It's at the uh, Palm Beach area. And I do meetings there all the time. But one of the meetings I held last year, which was in July, did you go to this one or no? Yeah. Where, where we watched uh, Nick Boletieri's documentary. I don't know if you've seen that one on Netflix or not. If you haven't seen it, it's a pretty solid uh, uh, documentary. Now, this guy is a guy that I knew of, but I didn't know him, know him, because I'm not in the tennis world. I didn't follow tennis, you know. But I watched the documentary, and I said, huh, so pretty epic personality. I think he says, yeah, I've been married seven or eight times. I lost count how many times I've been married. And, 
you know, his style was all psychological and, you know, the way he would, you know, coach people and pin them against each other and play games and sit on the other side with Courier while I you know, sit on this side and all of these games he played with his style of coaching versus yours. You guys are not far from each other. You're 30, 40 miles away from each other when he was uh, coming up. And I don't know. Where he, I think he's in Miami, right? Is he in Miami or is he in Bradington? He's, okay, Bradington. South and, Florida, for sure. And which is what, like 40 miles, give or take? I don't know. Uh, a little bit he's further. about three and a half yeah. hours. He's, like, on, oh, he's shit, like Tampa. Bra- no, he's yeah. on the oh, West, west Coast. Why did coast. I think he's down here? He used to be. But now he's at he was, I, no, he started Academy. At, yeah, yeah, he started at, in Miami yeah. long mm-hmm. ago, but he went to Bradington when in the early, to 80s, Bra- early okay. 80s. Got it. He's so, been all over South so Florida. So what is the style of coaching? Because conversations will come up. Who's the greatest tennis coaches of all time? And he has this stuff that's put put out there. Your name comes up. Brad Gilbert's name comes up. A lot of names comes up, right? This is the part of the competitiveness that we like to talk about. How different is your style of coaching versus his style of coaching? Um, well, I'm very different than everybody. I'm just cut from a different cloth. Um, I tell people all the time, you know, my favorite student of all time, who's ever on the other side of the net, that hour, that minute, that second. Uh, my name's on the door but I still teach 50 hours a week, whether it's to you, your son, the number one 80-year-old uh, guy in the country, or someone top 10 in the world. So I'm on the court all the time. There's no big machine behind me like marketing and pushing this thing and trying to become – there might be people more famous, but you know, let's just stack up kind of the resumes and just line up and see where everything is and really who you've worked with. But what I do is a little different. It's like a medley or a smorgasbord of everything. In one hour, there's going to be a lot of mental training. There's going to be a lot of tactical, strategical. There's dealing with the parents. It's putting Humpty Dumpty together and how I do this and the art of communication, okay, of how I do this. I've been on a tennis court since age 22 more than anybody in the world, and I'm still. That's my living room, you know, and so – what I do is very, very different, and I connect with people, and I can extract greatness out of How people. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, I got to find out with but, what buttons to push. Maybe what buttons I push with you are going to be different. I get people to believe, okay? But it's it's a it's a it's a package. Like anybody who's great, it's not just one thing. OK, it's a it's a combination of a lot of things. And so how I talk to an eight year old girl is going to be different than a 20 year old guy and how I put this together to motivate and get them to think big and stay in touch with them, uh, whether it be a, an emoji or a gift. There's there's just this constant getting stuff out of people. And, you know, the best reward is not all those people you mentioned who became number one or people that won Grand Slams. I mean, since 85, there's over 322 USJ national titles. Okay, that, that's, that's a lot. It's the people who maybe clean their room better or get better grades or they're not on drugs or they come back and they say the work ethic and these things they've learned from Rick Macy. So it's, a, it's more the ripple effect. But what's great about this, I don't try to do that. That's just part yeah. of the coaching. I don't need to pick up a chair and throw it at the person like Bobby Knight. Okay, I, I know when to hug him, okay? I know when to kick him in the butt. There's an art to this, and that's why— When's your birthday? What month's your birthday? December 7th, 1954. December 7th, got it. And I saw online you had three daughters. Do any one of them play uh, tennis or no? They did at a young age. That's, okay. a, that's another great question I because they're all very athletic, okay? And when they were like 8, 6, and 5, yeah. I, I took them to the tennis court— and it's like 110 degrees, and we ran laps around the court, and they went right out the gate to the drinking fountain. And I said, okay, gymnastics, we're going to the air conditioning. I ain't, listen, this is a brutal sport. And I said, listen, you, I'm a type of guy, either in or out. I either go for the jugular or we don't do this. And two of them were undefeated in gymnastics, by the way. And listen, they're all healthy, happy, and I raised all three of them by myself at age 13. So just for that, I should be in the Hall of Fame. You, really, you raised them all by yourself? From age 13, all three, besides working the crazy amount of hours. so But it's helped me also how I deal with other people. It's been just another part of you know your maturation. Rick, just out of curiosity, how many times have you been married? Twice. Twice. Okay, so Nick's got you beat in modern time being married. Yeah, he's only up reason, five of them. Only reason I ask this question is the following reason. I'm in the Army. I'm about to go into Special Forces, okay? 
So 18 Delta, I'm going to fifth group. I wow. love it. My captain, my colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Peacock, got all the orders I wanted. Everything I wanted, he got me. I'm going to go to Vicenza, Italy. I'm going to go to, the, the, uh, they're telling me to DLI because I speak four or five languages. I'm going to go to Sears. I'm going to go to, and then he says, but before you become special forces, I need you to go and interview with five special forces. It's three or five special forces guy to interview with. And I went and started talking. So I said, tell me about the life. What is to be special forces? What is to be special forces? Yeah. He says, well, uh, you ever want to have kids? Yeah. You ever want to have family? Yeah. You ever want to get married and stay married for a long time? Yeah. Never join special forces. <laughs> Why? Because this is your wife, your kids, your personal life, everything. You have to give everything to this to make it at this level, right? Do you think there's an element of that in the world of what you guys do? Because you're dealing with the kids, you're dealing with the parents, you're dealing with the athletes, you're dealing with trying to build a business, you're dealing with guys, you and Nick were going back and forth with Capriotti recruiting and his recruiting, your guy, your, your recruiting, his guy's like, well, now he's, but I never try to recruit the Venus. Well, I never try to recruit Cap. This competitiveness that happens because yeah. that's part of, I'm a business and that happens all the time, right? Yeah. It's annoying, it's frustrating, it's challenging. Do you think eventually it gets to a point that you say, you know what, uh, I'm going to retire from the marriage side and I'm just going to give my life to uh, uh, tennis and that's the game I'm going to play. Am I reading it correctly or I'm completely off? No, you're, you're, you're in the game, okay? okay. Right. Um, I, haven't been, I haven't been married since 2000, so now it's 2022. Got it. You know, and you know, I work seven days a week, you know, and I open up the park every morning and uh, I'm just all in because I answer everybody's call, everybody's email, even though there's 10 other guys yeah. that work for me and four fitness trainers. And, you know, I just, everything in life, you have to be happy and you got to do what works for you. And what works for me, um, you're right. Because I don't, if I'm on the phone, I don't want someone to say you got to get off yeah. or don't answer the phone. Okay. Or, you know, this, this, cause you got to remember I, the way I do it. Cause I control my models different. I have a different model, my Academy than anybody in the world. I drive that engine. Okay. Because I'm on the court all the time. We're not a glorified boarding school like IMG and Bradington. That's about marketing. That's about volume. Everybody has courts, palm trees, sunshine or whatever. But just like you saw in the movie, if you have potential and you want to dive in and you want Rick, okay, I'll help you. And that's a, that's a big thing. Who's delivering the goods for your kids? So your, so your offer is you're going to get more hands-on from me than if you go to a different place. You're going to get it from the coaches who report to the coaches who report to the coaches. You're going to get the copy of the copy of the copy. Is that kind of what you're saying? That's what's different with you than others? Absolutely. And okay. that's, 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 why, uh, that's why the model works. I mean, I drive that engine because people, you know, they obviously look at the track record, you know, been yeah. there, done that. But I'm just like, I'm just one of the guys. I'm so down to earth and, you know, genuine about this whole stuff. Um, I always keep my eye on the ball. And like I said, I, I treat everybody exactly the same. It doesn't matter if they're top 10 in the world or they just uh, want a lesson and they're five years old. You, you said you, you said you want people to be all in or else like your daughters. Well, right after the tennis practice, 110, they go drink water. You're like, nope, you're going to go gymnastics. That's what you're going to do. And they both, a couple of them are undefeated. But go back to you said, I said, what's your style of coaching? You said button. I know how to push buttons. Well, may work where you, may not work with this person, da, 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 da. Okay, great. I totally get it. Give me... I can come up with 20 different buttons. I've run a sales team for the last 20 something years. We have licensed 35,000 insurance agents and we have 20,000 insurance agents. And to drive them, you're right. It's very different. What's going to move her is not going to be what moves him. It's not going to be what moves them. Everyone's different. From your lens, making it at the 0.0001% of your world yeah. that you're in, how many different buttons are there? Give me a few of them. Well, okay, let's just go back to Venus and Serena because okay. I, knew, I knew what I had. Sure. Every time I talk to them and say they hit a certain shot, I would say something like this. That was good, but Hingis is going to get that. That was good, but Capriotti is going to get that or Steffi Graf. So here I am talking to an 11-year-old, even though it was a world-class shot, our eye was on a bunch different situation. And like Venus always says, she goes, Rick, I was almost brainwashed to be number one. You know, it's a different way to communicate wow. with them. You know, even when you miss, yeah. it's a positive error. Because what I teach more than anything is courage. Okay. I teach people to pull the trigger. I know how to, even though 
because most people have people try not to miss, okay? And you're just going to be a nice little college player, okay? And if you look at especially a lot of the girls I've trained, they all play kind of similar. They cut the court. They take the ball early. They're fearless. They attack. They swarm. Biomechanically, they're put together a little bit different, okay? So that would be one thing right off the bat, just the way I explain it. It's a positive error. Listen, two more inches, 10 more pounds, you get to the ball, you set your set, and you're smiling. That's going to be a winner. You miss that because you're 11. You know, I I got this, and then I feel, you know, kind of where the kid's at. If they need a little bit more or I got to be stronger, you know, with them. I just feel the temperature. So, Give me an example of stronger. Okay, I make kids run for every ball. I tell them the fences are out in Palm Beach County. I don't care if the ball's out, you know. One time, Venus, I told – I tell her by this, but you run for every ball. Just because the ball's out, anybody can put their finger up and call out. You run for every ball, even if it's 10 feet out, because someday, somewhere, somebody is going to put you in that position. And if your brain has been there, I've I've been there, that neighborhood, I'm going to feel comfortable. Okay, and one time I told this to Venus, and I had to keep telling her about it. So Richard goes, well, if you don't want to run, I'm out of here so you can just run home. So he made him run home 10 miles. Yeah, I remember that. When you say you have yeah. to run after every ball, and I played tennis, and I played football, and I remember there was a, in football, you'd have to, when you used to run routes, you would catch the ball, turn, and you would run upfield. And and I would always be like, well, I have to run 40 more yards. I'm like, the, you know, and in tennis, you know if a ball's clearly going out, if you want to kind of save your breath, you know, you'll let it go out. Are you saying that you would make them run to the end of the court, even though they knew it was out? What's the advantage of no, that? No, I try to get them, okay, it's the ability to improvise. You know, there's a fine line between great and good. Great can hit clutch shots when they're off balance and improvise. And I, I'm actually developing inner qualities, drive, persistence, mm-hmm. but run for every ball. See, a lot of the kids are glad just because it went out. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So if it's four feet out, I make them run for the ball, try to figure out how to improvise. Plus they're relaxed. They feel no pressure. And then they can, they can practice a shot. And so that's always been a staple Mm -hmm. um, of the training. Because I said, if you want to be different, you got to train different. And if they don't listen to me, they're probably not going to listen to a lot of people. So that's just one little snippet. Mm -hmm. But I get people to do things because I'm always about, okay, I get the ingredients. Okay, I put it in the oven, I bake it, and then I put the icing on it. When I have a 12-year-old, I'm already projecting how they're going to play at 18. And I'm playing for 18. I'm not developing a 12-year-old game. That's why I've had more kids become number one in the nation at 12. They come to me at 7 or 8. Bang. They're number one in the nation. Not that that means anything. That doesn't mean you're going to be top 10. But I knew it was Sharapova. I knew it was Jennifer. I, I, a lot, I can just – I didn't know it with Roddick, even though he was uh, had a, a lot of competitive things I like. Men's tennis is different. Total different physicality. Hmm. The girls is a little easier. But at the end of the day, this is kind of how I do the teaching and probably the best compliment. I certify coaches. They come from all around the world, and they're on the court with me four, five hours a day, three, four hours, I mean, three or four days, Yeah. and they watch me teach, and they ask questions, and they video. And even if these people played on the tour, okay, they're all blown away because they have no idea. You just don't read a book and say – Here's how to coach. They don't even have any idea about how to deal with the parents, how to motivate the kid. They didn't realize it was this cafeteria mm-hmm. of stuff. And this is what happens Did you catch all what he the said time. About, um, men and women's tennis is different. I, I, I just wrote yeah. it down. I just wrote it down here. But I want to I want to stay on this. We'll come back to this with the men and men and women. Matter of fact, let's just address it right now mm-hmm. since you brought it up. Uh, you know, there was an interview I saw. Where Serena's with uh, Jimmy Kimmel. I think it's Kimmel. I don't yeah. think it's found. I think it's Kimmel. And, well, you know, you think you can get out there and compete with men? He's like, no, no, no. I just want to compete with. He says, you don't understand. Uh, for me to go up against Andy Murray, there's no way I can compete against Andy Murray. You know, it, it's a very different game. The muscles are different. And she just unpacks it for Jimmy. And Jimmy's kind of like not wanting to hear that message mm. because Jimmy wants to say, you know, women can go out there and compete with men. For somebody who's coached both sides, you know, do, do, what do you think about what Serena said? Do you agree with her that it's very, very different to have a woman compete 
against the man. Because she said it was, it was a, a different number, sport. Yeah, no, the way said. the way she said, I would lose six zero if you want to put the story up, John. I would lose six zero six zero in five minutes. They told a, I don't know what article I was uh, reading, that said it, one of the uh, not professional, the amateur ranking that they have. They said 450th place of amateur ranking for men's would be the women's number yeah. one. Some weird number like that. Do you agree with that, or do you have a this different opinion? This came at the height of the Leah yeah. Thomas, William Thomas swimming debate. When yeah. Whatever number he was, and then became number one in the world. Anyway, yeah. your thoughts? Tennis, tennis is you know that's kind of tricky, but I agree 100 percent with Serena. She's right, and you got, like when she's saying it, she's coming from fact. She, you know, it wouldn't be five minutes. It would be longer than that. And she might scrape a game or two if she popped a few serves into the corner. But the, it's just more physical. The guys cover more real estate on the court because they're just bigger and stronger. It, it doesn't mean the, the, the girls wouldn't participate. You would have four, eight, maybe some 10 ball rallies, but it'd be a slow death to the end. Then bang, you know, it's in the serves. I mean, come on. 128, yeah, 140. No, I mean, Opelka, yeah. these guys are hitting 140. So, it, And what it, do the women serve? Tops. They can go into the 120, but the guys are, unless yeah. they hit the corner, it's coming back. It's just, You're talking 140 versus 120 max yeah, speed. Yeah, but it's not even the serve. I mean, you still got to get it in, and you're only mm-hmm. serving half the match. So it, it's, and it's just, it's, I don't want to say it's a different sport because, listen, the women are amazing. The guys just cover more real estate. You don't realize it because both guys are covering the real estate. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, a, it's like a, 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 a good high school guy bringing the ball up in the NBA, yeah. dribbling the ball. If the guy wanted to, he could steal it from him every time. But you don't see that in the NBA because the other guys, this is good. Here's but, what's crazy about this, though. Here's what's crazy. You know how sometimes they'll say, well, women don't make enough, uh, the same amount of money as men do in soccer. You know how that conversation, oh, women, basketball doesn't make as much right. money as NBA players. I am completely okay watching women's tennis. Maybe more than men's tennis. It's so weird. It's not the interest is there right. because it's still competitive. And yes, Serena and Venus and these girls are making a lot of money. They're making millions on top of millions of dollars of money. The dollar is not that big of a difference for the comparable to the eyeballs that they're getting versus in basketball. No, how many people are watching WNBA yeah. or watching? You know, this is a story Tyler just pulled up. If you want to put it up, FC Dallas under fifteen boys squad beat the U.S. women's national team in a scrimmage. I mean, this, this isn't is soccer? This isn't soccer, yeah. This is when you kind of see that there's certain right. sports it doesn't uh it doesn't help. Anyways, I saw Serena talking about but let's go back to yeah. let's go back to the coaching style. So your coaching style, would you say uh uh did you did you mirror any other coaches from other sports? Like are you a John Wooden guy? Could you sound like a John Wooden guy? Um, a few other people have said that. Not not really, you know. I, I think growing up in the Midwest and you know, just how I was brought up from my mom and just, you know, it's fr- from the heart. You gain the knowledge as you go down the yellow brick road, you know, and you always got to want to continue your education. But the ability to educate, motivate, you know, it's 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 that. And so I really never the biggest influence would be probably jo- Dr. Jim Lair, who was the number one sports psychologist that we spent some time together in the early 80s. He was a pioneer, and now there's many guys out there, but he was the first of the Mohicans, in my opinion. He was a pioneer. So, And I was always intrigued with the mental part. That's how I became kind of good in my own little bubble uh, of not having a lesson. Didn't he write a book or something? He, he, He's wrote about 20. Yeah, but he so, had that one book that was Mental sick. toughness training. Oh, yeah, my That was the first This guy's one. a legend, by the way. No, no. Jim's like one Dude, of my best friends. Have you read any of this guy's books? I'm not familiar with oh, it. It's insane. If you pull... I mean, anyway, so yeah. So he, so uh, he, he yeah, was close. Was, yeah, so, you know, I, and we used to play all the time. Yeah. And, you know, when this was early 80s at Greenleaf. So that would be really the only person. I never, you know, you get the knowledge as you go on. And it's just... Your love and concern for the person. And, you know, when you see the movie, you know, it comes across loud and clear how Bernthal played me. Even though even though his mustache looked like a, a shrubbery, I had this little piece of astroturf <laughs> that took me 30 years to grow. Um, you could see how much I cared for the girls and that Richard was my best friend. And I, we were just on a mission. And when you, when your students feel that, that you would do anything, you can get them to jump over mountains. And everybody feels that way. Um, 
when I'm on the court with them. It doesn't matter. It's just the way I'm wired. That's all. You know, uh, uh, I think there is different levels of coaches for different times. Meaning, you know how Nick Saban tried to go to NFL and he wasn't a good coach. Not that he wasn't a good coach. He didn't win, and then he went back to college. He crushed it, right? Calipari went to the NBA with the Nets, I believe. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, and then he went back to college and he crushed it, right? Patino. Patino. Uh, By the way, Celtics. The, but but the one that worked was uh, uh, Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll USC. went to college to NFL, back yeah. to college, back to NFL, and then you know he did very well. And Pete mm -hmm. Carroll is more like, come on, we can do it. You know, he's like more. He's like a player. He's coach. more like. Yeah, but Bill Belichick is not like that. Yeah. That's not Bill Belichick. That's not his style. Do you think uh, there is a, a Styles of coaching that work at a certain age with a kid that maybe if, let's just say, if I'm trying to develop my kid's confidence, maybe they would do better with a style of a coach like yours or wooden, that someone's going to give them confidence. And then when it goes into the pros, like, hey, listen, man, here's how this thing works. Here's how it's going to be. And then someone's going to be kicking their asses to challenge them and realize, here's what we have to do. Yeah. And I understand there's still the relationship part. Come, we'll cook for you. Let's have a good time. You know, you need to know that I trust you. You need to know that I believe in you. But the level of intensity goes slightly higher as the levels increase and the age increases. Would you agree with that? Kind of. You okay. know, it's, it depends on the person. It's so individual. You know, you just can't. It's not one size fits all. It's because you're dealing with different people. Now, tennis, it's one on one. Football, there's a whole cast of characters, just like the NBA. You know what I mean? You can see the Brooklyn Nets. I mean, they're. They're saying, you know, get rid of Nash. I mean, we don't need a coach. That's kind of what they thought. Mm. But the NBA comes down to like at the final few minutes and there's strategic things that a coach can come in. But I also, I need to chime in here. I think the coaching, when you said, I went to the NFL, then the college, whatever, you got to look at the team also. I mean, you know, the quarterback. And you got to look at the players. And then even when I you asked me the question uh, when about, like Venus, Serena, Caprati, Roddick, Mesquina, Pierce, Sonia Kennan, okay, all these people that I coach, um, I help them enormously, but I feel I helped so many other people a lot more, okay? Because to win the Derby, you got to have the horse. You ain't going to do it with a, mm. a donkey. I can make the donkey have great mechanics, but it's still a donkey, yeah. okay? So you got to remember, you got to remember uh, the coaching, the, it kind of goes both ways. I mean, I don't think it'd be difficult, you know, right now for somebody to start coaching Nadal. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's already, you got to understand, or each, even when, when Patrick started coaching uh, Serena, nothing gets Patrick. Okay. But she already had like 15 grand slams. I mean, you just can't screw it up. Okay. So that, putting this thing together, okay, the, the, the cards you're dealt with at a young age in a lot of ways, even from yeah. your family, it's a it's it's more complex than just saying you need someone to kick your butt when you're older because you got to know how to deal with that person and even in the NBA, you know what I mean? They treat people different. You don't think people, the coaches of the Lakers, treat LeBron differently? I mean, come on, you got to understand. Yeah, for, I mean, he wanted to get supposed from fire when he's in Miami. Yeah. So it's it's a tricky thing. LeBron, anytime they start losing, he wants to coach. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a, silly. Yeah, it's silly. He yeah. he's been like that for a long time, and and that's become a habit with a lot of people. Well, he's the goat. Yeah. Other than MJ, who? LeBron. LeBron. I Doesn't agree. that defeat the term of the the purpose of the word goat? No, greatest well, of all time. You can't be the greatest of all time. I mean, other arguably. Than, well, he, he, can I ask Rick like, a question? Because you know we're doing a, we're talking a lot about coaching and what it takes to be a yeah. great coach and your technique. I actually want to flip it because Pat had mentioned he's got four kids. Three of them are actually starting to do sports, right? I mean, Tico's a little bit, but Dylan for sure. Senna, I believe as well. Gymnastics, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and all my friends, all their kids are starting to become, you know, six, eight, ten, twelve. They're, they're, you know, they got kids in sports. I, my relationship, I used to be, I was a sick athlete in Miami, football, basketball. I had the worst relationship with my dad. He was the most overbearing, like, at every game, yelling, talking shit, yelling at me. I'm yelling at him. I mean, you dealt with Richard Williams. What does it take to be a good parent to a sportsman, to a sports girl, right? It's like, what, what are the qualifications that you see that the parent needs to have for their kid to be successful? Well, first off, first off, another great question. You know, they, they have to be more of a psychologist than a coach. That's number one. 
Remember, they're always going to look at you like dad or mom. And it's very different how you have that relationship with a boy and a girl. Because with a girl, the dad's always more involved because it's daddy's little girl. They're more protective. You know, besides Richard Williams, Capriotti, Jim Pierce, I've had some of the, you know, fathers from, you know, outer space or whatever. So these guys were were all in. But you got to remember at 18, or they get a boyfriend, or they get their driver's license, you could be toast. So you got to be real careful. It creates divorce. It creates problems. You got to be real careful with this. But on the other hand, you got to know how to push them, but you got to support them. You got to try to make them the best athlete you can. You got to instill confidence in them. You got to get them to believe. You don't know what's inside a young child. Nobody does. I got a better feel than most people. And that's why I've had people move mountains and they never thought they could do this or that. And they get a full ride to UCLA or Georgia or they end up, you know, 50 in the world someday. They never thought they could do that of their parents. And so that would be the role of the parent. But it's it's a problem because they're all in. They're on the fence like Little League Baseball. Mm -hmm. They're they're psychotic. You know, they can't wait to the weekend. It's a Super Bowl. Remember, that's them playing. That's not even their kid. They're like Will Smith and Richard. You know, they're yeah. they're them. It's their kid. And it, it, I had this with Greg Olson. You played for the Panthers, and the I just end? did his podcast. Yeah, he's yeah. in. He does this youth sports thing, and he goes, Rick, I, I think I'm becoming one of them. And right. he's been there, done that. You know, and he's an NFL Pro Bowler. And you got to understand, you're, it's your kid, right. and you got to make sure you can separate it because it. You, it can burn the kid out. Hmm. You got to motivate. Listen, the, no one died. You know, the sun's going to come out to, up tomorrow. You, it's about the process of getting better. And I tell her body, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. It's not where you start. It's where you finish. This is a long-term process. What's the goal? Get the best college scholarship. The grades are important. Just keep getting better. You got to get better. But it's hard to do that because it's all about winning. Because people come up, how'd you do? I lost. Yeah. I won. You want to talk about the cocktail party? I get all that stuff. But it, it's it's a journey. And that's what I loved about Richard Williams. When he said, we're not playing any junior tournaments. And this is in the movie. In the movie, it kind of had me freaked out. Like, wait a minute. You didn't tell me that in Compton. I was okay with not playing because Venus and Serena would run over broken glass to get to a ball. And then they'd run back over it to get the next one. They were so competitive. If there was a piece of bread on the table, they'd fight to get it. So I, I did, they didn't need to compete to learn how to win and lose. So I knew on Monday we weren't dealing with a junior tournament. Why'd you lose? We were just developing. Now, but I'm not so stuck in my way as a coach, as you mentioned. Wait, I coach Venus Serena. They didn't play any junior tournaments. Here's the blueprint. Shut it down. No, I'm not like that. Okay, I, I got to feel the temperature. Some need to play more, some less. But no, that's a gr- great question. By the way, so. breaking news, Elon Musk officially bought Twitter. Okay. Oh, damn. Twitter and Elon Musk strike a deal for takeover. It's a done deal. Let's read the story. Can you go up so you can zoom in? I can read that. Tyler, go up a little bit. Go up a little bit. Go up a little bit. Zoom in. Control plus. Control plus. Uh, okay, so let's see right there. Twitter Inc. on Monday accepted Elon Musk bid to take over the company. Given the world's richest man controlled the influential social media network where he is also among its powerful users, the deal marks the close of a dramatic court trip. Courtship and a sharp uh, change of heart at Twitter, where many executives and board members initially opposed Musk's uh, takeover approach. The deal has polarized Twitter's employees and users and regulators over the power take giants. Wheeled in determining the parameters of acceptable discourse on the Internet and how companies enforce their rules, the two sides worked through the night to hash out a deal. Earlier on Monday, the Wall Street Journal reported Twitter and Mr. Musk reached an agreement to value Twitter at $44 billion a takeover. If it goes through, would mark one of the biggest acquisitions in tech history and will likely be have Global repercussions for years to uh, come related to how billions of people use social media. Musk, who is also the CEO of Tesla and Space Exploration Technology, must find a way to balance his commitment less moderation with the business uh, needs of a company that has struggled to reconcile freewheeling conversations with content that appeals to advertisers on Monday uh, after the journal reported that a deal was closed. Mr. Musk uh, indicated, tweeted to indicate that he wants the platform to remain destination for wide-ranging discourse and vi- disagreement. I hope that even my worst critics remain on Twitter because that is what free speech mm. is all about. So five-step on what this guy's going to do. Move number one, he bought Twitter. Move number two, he's going to take it private. Move number three. 
okay, and what this guy's going to do, that's going to piss off a lot of people, okay? He's going to bring Jack back, okay? He's going to bring Jack back, Jack Dorsey, because Jack left because it just wasn't working out with the board. Everybody thought Jack was the bad guy. Jack didn't own 51% of the company when he left. He only owned a couple percent when he left. He'll bring Jack back. He will eliminate Tom Brady's picture from the combine because that's what he owes to him. <laughs> and then he's going to bring a guy back that's going to, when he does that, forget about it. When, when he, he does what? When he brings back Trump's your best sure. friend, he brings Trump's Trump sure. back, which the he Trump's was a student of yours, by the way. We you, got, a, we got, I got great stories with the Trumpster. Wait, wait, <laughs> till hold you, on. No, you I, coach I, Trump? I, <laughs> No. <laughs> what are you saying right now? You want me to get into that? Right, so he's let coming back just, on Twitter. So right? if, if Trump comes back, and if, if there's anybody that's going to bring tr- uh, Trump back on Twitter, it's going to be who? It's going to be Elon Musk. It's going to be Elon. If he, look at that picture right there when... Uh, when uh, Looking uh, thick so, with I about seven I didn't teach C's. him that shot. I didn't teach him that yeah. shot. <laughs> anyway, so, so, so that story is official. Wow. And this guy, if you would... How you excited have, are you right now, Pat? You know what I'm excited about? I'm excited about the fact that people can officially go out there and say stuff and not have to worry about every other word is going to be uh, taken out of context and mm. they're going to be taken down. I think people are I, free again. But I go agree, ahead. Pat. Yeah, I agree. You, good. Yeah. We're on the same page. Yeah. So you said you have a Trump story. Tell us. I got a lot of them. Any, <laughs> any, anyways, this was, uh, this was uh, the late 90s, and I had a girl who was uh, number one in Florida, in the 18s, she was 14 years old, and she was actually with IMG, which is a management company. Mm-hmm. And the father approached me about coaching her, and she modeled, she and she sang also, and she was good at both besides playing tennis. And he approached me about coaching her and represented her because he didn't think IMG took her modeling and singing, uh, you know, serious enough, and they wanted her to deliver the goods. And as a tennis player, before we got into the other stuff. So he came to me, and I said, I have an idea. And I knew uh, Trump had a management company called T-Management. So we set up. I called the, the pro there, and we went there. He goes, yeah, listen, Donald comes out every Saturday. He goes through the uh, by the uh, spa. He'll come through the tennis, say hi to everybody. Then he goes and plays 18 holes. So be out here practicing Saturday so we were there practicing on a Saturday. Uh, I had Monique, this girl, hitting with a guy 180 in the world. They're just ripping ground strokes back and forth. Now, you got to remember, the Trumpster, he's walking through there every day. He's probably seeing hamburgers and cheeseburgers, cl- the, the club players. And he's seeing this girl out there, you know, who looks decent, okay, just crushing ground strokes. And he goes up to the, the pro they have there and starts talking, and he points down. And so he comes down to me. He introduced himself. He goes, who is that? I got a box at the U.S. Open. This girl looks really good. So I tell him the story, blah, 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 blah. He goes, listen, anything I can do, let me know. So he goes off. Two weeks later, me and the dad fly to New York. We meet with general counsel, okay? Um, We do the deal for them to represent uh, Monique, okay? I'm going to run the tennis part, okay? There's like 20% involved. Team management gets 10. I get 10. So this was like the middle of summer. Then what happened? So uh, we had a flight at 6 o'clock. We go into Donald's office. He goes, you going back to Florida? I go, yeah. He goes, I want you to come back on the plane with us. Okay? Hmm. I said, no problem. So we go back early. Great guy. Okay. So we get on there. There's a lot of people going from New York down to Mar-a-Lago for the weekend. Uh, Donald's in there throwing potato chips at people, pretzels, peanuts. He's just like <laughs> just a, the, the nicest guy, all right? He sat with me, and there's a lot of people on this flight, for two hours, got up now and then, talking about Herschel Walker, New Jersey mm, Generals, yeah. tennis, football, baseball, basketball. I mean, just such a down-to-earth guy, communicator, okay? A very versatile guy. Um, remember, he's not president. This was 19... 19- this was 2000. He was thinking about it, but he was doing that probably to get mm-hmm. some publicity. Mm-hmm. So back then. So then he invites me to come to Mar-a-Lago whenever we want, so on and so forth. So now this is the best. So now the U.S. Open comes. I'm going back and forth with Nike and Fila. I'm negotiating to get this girl a contract. So listen to this. This is epic. Midnight, hallway, on a napkin. Okay, I secure... million to 
$600,000 guaranteed, okay, for a 14-year-old girl to wear Fila clothing. I do it on a napkin in the hallway with general counsel. He goes, Rick, you got you to come to Trump Tower the next day, and uh, we'll tell Donald we did this deal. So we go there the next day. He goes, uh, Bernie Diamond was the guy, and he goes, we go into Donald's office. He goes, uh, you, it was amazing how Rick it was doing this whole thing, and uh, it was just amazing. He got $1.8 million, so I know that the Trumpsters already adding up what I made him. <laughs> he goes, listen, I knew when I was at Mar-a-Lago, you were the best, and you're the best. I said, of course you're calling me the best. I just made you $180,000. He goes, well, you're really yeah. even the best now. <laughs> so, so, no, so listen, he was uh, just a down-to-earth guy, and, you know, when he um, became president, that next, because I went to bed that night. I didn't know what happened. Next day I woke up. I put all 50 kids out there, and I, it's on YouTube. I gave the speech of all time. You talk about, forget Rocky Balboa, forget 69 Mets, forget Venus walking off the street and almost beating number one. This is the greatest upset in the history of life. This guy had daggers, knives, bullets, the media coming every direction at him. Okay, he doesn't need this stuff. He's taking, he's mowing down people left and right and the media. Okay, you got to understand how mentally strong it is. Forget the personality. You got to look at the character, the drive, the persistence, the inner qualities of this guy. Forget all the nonsense. If you just look at how the guy's yeah. wired, okay, you got to respect that. Okay, and this is, listen, I'm not a political guy. At the end of the day, uh, I, I just love winners. Are the rumors true that you're considering being part of his cabinet in 2024? Um, if he asked me, I wouldn't. I'm going to be on the tennis court. <laughs> <laughs> 50 hours a week. <laughs> Craziness with the uh, – is that the cool – story. Is, you got another Trump story or is that the one that you got? Uh, that's uh, the one you're yeah, yeah, it's hard to beat that one. You got it. That's, that's, okay. that's like epic. Right. I like that. I like that story you got there. By the way, uh, tennis-wise, you said Carlos Alcaraz is going to be the best of all time? Yeah, and I was uh, the flavor of the month in Spain after that quote. Mm -hmm. Listen, I uh, I was actually at the Miami Open, and I went down there for the semis and finals with uh, I was with Christian Rude, the, the best player ever to come out of Norway. He got to like thirty nine in the world. Where his son Casper is now is now like uh, five in the world or yeah. six in the world. Yeah, so he's I from went Norway. To, yeah, he's from Norway. We got a big uh, fan base in Norway. Just so you know, <laughs> okay. Seriously. So listen, at the end of the day, I went down there, we reunited, I uh, sat in the box with him, and I did get to see Casper play Alcaraz, and I call him Alcatraz because he puts everybody in prison, okay? <laughs> so, so he, I, but I've seen him play before, and I already called it, but all the nuances he brings, the athleticism, his hips turn faster, people don't see this, than anybody I've seen. He has a drop shot from outer space that he can just, he just like, it's sick, hmm. but he's a showman. He loves crowds. He was born for this. He's steady, cut from the same cloth as Nadal. His serve still needs a little work. I'm, I'm going on the record. I, I mean, I predict a lot of things. I think he'll go down, barring injury, greatest player of all time. Wow. Like How old is that? he now? Well, I said this with Federer when he was 19. I said this with Pete, too, Sampras, hmm. okay, because I look at this thing very different. And I said, I even told wow. people, I think he'll be number one by the end of the year. How old is he right now? And he's 18. He's 18. What's and he ranked in the world? He's now entered the top 10. He's in the top. Number well, nine. Let me ask Never you. Never been done. But wait, one more thing. Yeah. He's so complete. There's no holes in his game. But he eats pressure for breakfast. And he can move. Uh, he'll win the French Open. Interesting. You're going to hear it right here. 18. He'll win the French Open double figures. Okay. You're, I'm just telling you where this is going to go. But he can play on all surfaces. He's going to be more vulnerable when guys have big serves like anybody. No one's going undefeated. No one ever has in any sport. All I'm saying is it's a generational player. Mm. I've seen this movie for 30 years. And I said he's Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic wrapped in one. Okay. He was born to do this, barring injury. We're seeing something that's so special I can't even tell you. Interesting. I'm looking at Very the uh, the top 10 rankings yeah. here. Please explain why no American is in the top 10. And I feel like no American men's tennis player has been in the top 10 for like a decade plus. What's going on in America? You think I've been asked that question before? Yeah, I mean, no, you're for, an American tennis coach. Yeah. Well, What's going on with America? Okay. 
Well, the last guy, the last of the Mohicans was Andy Roddy. Right. And okay. he wasn't even as good as any of the guys that we're talking about, Federer, Nadal, Djokovic. He wasn't even as good as Sampras Agassi, nothing. No, you're right about that. But I feel Andy overachieved. Uh, he won one Grand Slam, could have mm-hmm. won two if he doesn't miss that high back end volley against Federer at Wimbledon. But at the end of the day, um, here's what happens. The great athletes, I don't mean good. There's a lot of good athletes, mm-hmm. very good friends with Francis, Tiafo, Riley Opelka, who I coached a little bit at 12 and 13. Uh, Taylor Fritz is not bad. There's a difference between great and good. Great is rare air. We're all good, all of us in this room. You know, it's a, it's a different fraternity. And I tell people all the time, if I'd have had LeBron, okay, at age 10, mail it in, number one tennis player in the world, okay? Mm. The guy would have served a buck 50. He'd have been lightning in a bottle, ferocious competitor. The best athletes Go to football, baseball, and basketball. It's easy to grab a ball and shoot a jumper. It's easy to go outside and tackle your neighbor. Okay, you don't, the, tennis is expensive. And so the best athletes in other countries, I mean, look at Medvedev, the guy's like Gumby on steroids. So a 6'6", six, six, and the guy moves and his tentacles are everywhere. Djokovic is made of rubber. You know, they get better athletes. We get good athletes. Okay, and I've you're always, saying our best athletes end up playing basketball, yeah, football, no, baseball. You're saying, yeah, and then there's the mental part, how mm-hmm. you're brought up. Your environment has a lot to do with it. Remember, I called Venus and Serena what I saw under the hood. I didn't see it on the outside. I if I based on the outside, I would have taken a cab to the airport and left Compton. I mean, I based it on the inside. Okay, I knew what I could do technically, and this is what happens. And I've talked to the USTA about this. They, they don't want to look for the needle in the haystack. What I would do, to answer your question, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds, yes, that young, okay, did their parents play the Olympics, NBA, NFL? Okay, you get the genetic base, so you got a few things covered, running, jumping, better maybe environment. Quarter might have that, okay, Quarter, the he might win a few grand slams. He'd be the one American, I think, that could do that. Um, so you got these bases covered running, jumping, competing, and then biomechanically, you get them with someone like a Rick Macy who can get your serve, not just 140, but it's going to go in. And you got a a forehand like Federer and a backhand like Joker. So you put, there's no weaknesses, but you put them on a great athlete. But you get these kids young, you do running, jumping, you draw blood like they do in the Olympics. You can test for all this stuff Mm. and you got to fund it. You got to put money into the. How do you make your money? Like I'm always watching, like Nick. I'm like I'm going all in with this. I'm I'm not gonna. How do you make your money on the back end? Is it like boxing where the you know trainer gets like five percent, or is it like UFC where the you know corner man gets ten percent? What's the business model for you? Because Nick Nick was done broke. He had no money at the end of the documentary. You're watching it. The guy's got nothing to his name. Lost everything, and he gave his life to these. Oh, you didn't see that. The guy ended. Didn't that, he no. didn't have any money. I think the way it ended. Uh, 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 what's the organ? What's the tennis uh, uh, courts in UMG or something like that? IMG. 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 They they got all his stuff. They got all his land. They got everything that he owned. They took from him because he had nothing left. And they mm. specifically changed the name to not have Nick's name be anywhere. They didn't want Nick Bolateri's name Damn. anywhere. So what is the business model for a Nick or a Rick to make money? Okay. Well, there's. Let's go back a little bit. There's a backstory. Nick got $7 million when IMG took over his thing, but he might have been $7 million in debt. That's not a lot of money. I don't don't know that whole thing. So they took that blueprint, and they made it into something, football, baseball, basketball. They turned it into something that's just epic. But eliminated everything having to do with his name. Yeah. Like almost like this is non-existent. Here's the founder of the organization, and there's – Nothing about him. And IMG is massive, right? Massive. Yeah, massive. 85 Athletes. grand a year. I don't know what the number is, but it's a pretty big number. Yeah, so, so but to answer your question, uh, the, the situation with the Williamses was different because I had to fund the project besides sweat equity. You know, when you say, do guys get it on the back end? You're right. They might get it on the back end and not get paid. You know, there, a lot of these peep coaches, they might do something for Osaka or someone, and they don't even have a contract. And sometimes yeah, it's sometimes that. it's not enforceable because of a minor and the parent. It becomes tricky, you know, with some of these contracts. How with are you kids. protected, though? But I don't get into these type things. I only did that with Venus and Serena. Well, if you want me to, if you want me to coach you, 
Okay, I, I do a private for 800 an hour. You know, it's a very different thing. I don't do it for like free. If you want to leave, it's it's a it's a business. I don't do it so for like... So you don't care if they leave you at this point. You're making 800 bucks an hour. Yeah, I, it's a straight... But with Venus and Serena, that was different, okay? That was a whole different thing. So did you make money on the back end? Uh, yeah, we worked it all out. Okay. I don't want to get into the no, no, real details. No, of course, details. I don't want the details. Yeah. I just want to know money was Abs- made on the back a- end. Absolutely. Okay, um, you know, but that was a very different thing, and I haven't done it since. And you could imagine, even after the movie, I've probably been asked to do it over a thousand times because I my kids uh, better uh, than Venus and Serena. Yeah, I don't. Right. I don't know about me. You know, like sitting there saying, "Okay, you put all this time, all this, and all of a sudden, I guess you go signs a contract with this person, that person, this person." Nick's like left out, and hey, what happened to all those years? No, you know, you're asked out now. No, what happened? This guy. And, you know, credit's not given. And anyways, I'm sure you, if you read the letter that Agassi wrote to him at the end, it's a pretty painful letter that he wrote to him uh, about the ending of uh, uh, the story. Agassi's family is related to me. I'm Armenian Assyrian. So right. there, he lives in Vegas, Susan, all those people that go into UNLV. But anyways, going back to this, uh, you know, a topic of you said something earlier. You said, I don't have time to, you know, I, I only want the best. I only want the best. I only want the best. Okay, fine. Um, how do you react when you see a Ben Simmons, oh, I strained my back in the game yesterday. Oh, but the Phillies still have to pay me. The 76ers still have to pay me 20 million bucks. Oh, you know, uh, uh, Simone Biles, oh, this is too much pressure. You guys don't know how much pressure there is. I know. I'm sure there's a lot of pressure from everybody. Oh, you know, uh, uh, Naomi Osaka, somebody said, you suck. Can I get the mic and say something? I thought that was very weird to have something like that happen. You know, how do you handle, you know, everything that these kids are going through and now they're becoming adults with social media, with all of that, yet you said the Dr. Lohr, however you pronounce Lair, however you pronounce his name, he wrote those uh, engagement, something about engagement, full engagement. Everything's about mental toughness. Everything's about emotional toughness. Everything's about that. Everything. How do you manage what these kids and athletes are saying nowadays, it's too much anxiety for me to play sports. How do you manage that? Yeah, well, first off, one of the things I, I try to teach everybody, having the ability to forget is more important than remember. Probably not just sports, but life. Yeah. I mean, some people are still mad about stuff 20 years later, hmm. and that's a skill. you got to have the ability to flip things in your mind and take a negative and turn it into a positive. And it's hard because everything's black and white. Like you said, with social media, everybody is, is more sensitive to, to all this stuff. But at the end of the day, it was Simmons and Biles and Naomi, since I don't really know them and how they're wired, I'm just looking from the outside you know, it's ironic because it's easy maybe to take that approach because you're still all making a lot of money. You know, Saka is getting $50 million a year. Uh, uh, you know, Simmons is making all this money. Same with Biles. So I don't really know them, but looking from the outside, it's it's a bad look for anybody. You got to toughen up, you know. Uh, that's what people are going to say. But I don't really like to comment on that because I don't know them. If you ask me about someone else and I knew him, I could tell you exactly what the temperature was and why that is going on. Well, let me ask you this. You're, uh, when you uh, uh, coach the, the folks that you coach, Gary Capriati, all the names that you just said, right, that you coach, Roddick, all those guys, uh, how, did, how would you have handled it if one of them, or maybe did you ever have a player that came up that constantly was like mental and emotional, anxiety, all of that, and you just eventually said, look, the pros just may, may not be for you. You know, you may want to go to a different job because this comes with a lot of pressure. How did you handle that when that came up when you were coaching them? Well, that does come up in the juniors because people get nervous. I've never had anybody like at the mountaintop say that like some of these people that you've discussed. I mean, that's a whole that's a whole different deal when they have had all that success and money and they've went through the process and they've learned how to win and lose and they've won grand slams. It's a little different, but we don't know what's going on in their personal life. There could be just a lot of other stuff that's going on. So once again, I got to, I would talk to them. Okay. That this comes with the territory. If you want to be great, this is what it's all about. You know, having the ability to forget you, you, it's a skill. Okay. If you're going to react to everything, you might nibble near the top, but you ain't going to stay there. 
because greatness can stay there because they're consistent mentally. So unless I knew exactly, um, a perfect example is Roddy. You know, he was so mentally strong. I knew his forehand was going to be nuclear and the serve that I helped him achieve was going to be supersonic, but he was just a dog. You know, he was bulletproof. I loved watching him play. No, I interviewed him five, six years ago. Oh, Roddick. Yeah, I had Roddick on by Tim, and I, he's a guy. He, man, he was exciting to watch. Yeah, you know, he had limitation, but at the end of the day, he's had the best quote of everything. He's, when he started making all this money, he goes, yeah. listen, everything else around me has changed, but it's still me and you and the court, and I'm going to kick your yeah. butt. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I love watching I, I him I got to actually... I don't want to say push back on you, but I got to follow up. Yeah. I know you said you, you know, you don't really work or you're, you're kind of from a distance with the Ben Simmons of the world and the Simone Biles. But Naomi Osaka is a tennis player, a yeah. female tennis player. You've coached dozens, if not hundreds of female tennis players. You coached Serena and Venus Williams. Hello. Yeah. She made her name beating Serena, I believe. Yeah. Right. And she cried and she won. You know, I don't remember what tournament it was, but US Open. US yeah. Open. She was yeah. a big winner. Yeah. And then now this past year, she's had her issues. I mean, if you can kind of get into the mind of her, because I believe you probably do know her better than yeah. any other, you know, under the players that we mentioned. But if you were her coach or if you were advising the coach, what specific things would you do? Because you do have experience with this exact type of person. Yeah. No, you know, like I said, there has to be a lot of stuff off the court because her life has changed. When you go from maybe having not a lot to be the richest female athlete, on the planet okay and you know she's uh, in japan she's just iconic so if you're either in or out i I, to me i'm black and white about this stuff you you got to be so mentally strong if if you're going to be in you're in if you're out you're out you you can't be half in and you can kind of see that in her performance she's not all there because if you don't want to die to win every point you're going to lose against better players. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what people don't see. They might see, oh, my kid has a better serve or forehand. They don't know what's under the hood. And her mental toughness was her strength. And now that she's being sensitive and stuff like that, I would have a very different conversation uh, with her. I don't even know if I'd want to coach her if a player responded like that, unless I had more information, then I'd have a little better feel. Let me ask the question a different yeah. way because I know what you're, you're 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 walking. You know, you're in the business, so you can't really give the answer on a mic that you you know. Uh, anyway, so I I understand. That. I respect that. But let me ask the question a different way. When you were coaching in the eighties, nineties, you've you've coached in five different decades. No, am I saying it correct? There were six different yeah. decades. Five different decades, right? Yep. Okay, so. How much was this the topic of discussion in the 80s, 90s, 2000s? Amazing question. Never. Okay, that's the question. That's no, what I'm saying. No, that's it's the never. Real question. Yeah. Ne- never. Yeah. Never. One, you're, saying, you're saying mental toughness or what? Not Anxiety? Mental toughness, depression? Mental, like, oh my God, I can't no, handle this. No. Thing. No, it's because it's, it's, it's all, a real thing these days. Yeah, no, it's, it's not a real No, 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 no. no they're making it a real thing, yeah. is what so you're saying. Ahead, continue. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's the social media, it's entitlement. Mm-hmm. Kids are brought up different. You know, there's, you know, kids are a little more spoiled. You know, things are easier. You know, it's, it's, it's just different. Even physical fitness different. Kids got in shape by just running around outside playing tag. Now you got trainer. It's a, it's a different world and it's created, uh, created a lot of marshmallows mentally. You mm. know what I'm saying? And so, but that's, that's the question right there. This never, ever came up to the point where you even kind of felt it, let alone, would express it like that. I mean, so that means it's, it's very deep. So, so how can kids be kids be mentally tougher? It sounds like you agree ex- with exactly what Pat was Pat was going I, with I that agree question. Exactly. How what do Pat you was keep saying. your kids you're coaching these no, days? Let me from ask being a different soft. question. Sure. Let me ask a different question. Let me ask a different question. You're the expert. We're just amateurs here. We're not in the world. <laughs> we're in a completely different world. We're in. Okay. How much of this is a problem? that was non-existent, that's been created purely out of the, you know, out of the imagination of, you know how they say all these new, uh, 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 for what's, what's the uh, uh, phobics that we have, afraid of this, afraid of that, afraid of this, Phobias. whatever, and then you need these new medicines, you need this new, this new, this big pharma's making all this money based on different fears that they're making, and all these medicines that people are taking is based on all these phobias that was created by these uh, scientists who represent these big pharmas. Again, uh, these are stories we've all read about. 
How much of it is just fabricated that's got these kids believing, I really have this issue? Yeah, a, a lot of it. Okay. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's like everybody wants a quick fix, okay? Uh, to <laughs> to get anywhere, you, you got to take the stairs, not the escalator. You know what I mean? It's Everybody wants a quick fix on everything. Yeah. Um, but no, you're you're right. This this never existed. But I need to dive in about the family component. A lot of this also is the mom and dad, okay? Because not that they have total control over it, but they are raising kids. I'm so glad you're saying uh, that. they they are yeah. raising kids. Yeah. Some just throw them out yeah. there and let them grow like grass. Yeah. Other water it and fertilize it. Yeah. You know, so the parents, you know, they want their kid to be rough and tough and you know, be competitive and take a punch and then they go to the ball and buy them a Gucci bag. So, you know, it, it's, it's just a bizarre thing that it's a lot of it is the parent, you know, and I'll go back to where I started, you know, this interview, Richard, Richard Williams, yeah. what I saw at nine and 10. Okay. Which other people didn't, it wasn't on the outside. The outside was a train wreck. Sorry, Venus, Serena. It was a train. But I've already told him that. It was a train wreck on the outside. But on the inside, I never saw it. So that box was checked and a few others because yeah. I knew I knew that's the wild card. You don't know how people are going to freak out under pressure. A quarterback, when some guy wants to knock him out, yeah. you know, when the game's on, you don't know that. And I saw they the minute I changed the game to, like, competitive, it, it – it kind of freaked me out and I've never been freaked out about anything. So, but that was done at a young age. And that's probably why Richard Williams was just saying all this insanity. Uh, Cause he saw the same thing, but it took someone that had that eye. Cause on the outside, you can't see it. So, so um, uh, 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 sports stats. Okay. Let, let's go through some of those. Okay. You got uh, tiger's dad. Okay. You got uh, LeVar Ball. You got uh, uh, the Manning's father, who's got two boys. Archie with Manning. Two, Archie Manning's got two boys mm-hmm. with two Super Bowls each, which is insane, right? Yep. You got King Richard. You got Emmanuel Agassi. You got a lot of these stories, right? MJ's and and dad. MJ's dad, yeah, but, he, you know, okay, fine. You can put MJ's dad there as well. All these stories with these dads. So then the question becomes the following. You know how when I talk to investors, I say, what's most important? The entrepreneur the talent and the entrepreneur's uh, team, the idea, the technology, what's most important, right? Or you'll ask, hey, uh, Tom uh, uh, Penn, who was a GM for the Philadelphia 76, I think he was GM, yeah. and then he went to ESPN. So what's most important, the ownership team, a great coach, a superstar player, or a great GM, right? You ask these questions. Yeah. Okay. In these specific examples, Williams, okay, Agassi, you know, Mannings, all this stuff, Who gets the bigger percentage of success? Okay, and I know this is the last thing you want to be pressured to talk about because I think it's what percentage is parents, what percentage is kids? No, it's it's to me the biggest percentage is always the parents. You got to remember this is a genuine. And by the way, how big of a percentage? By the way, it could be well over seventy five percent. I I, this is the genetics. Listen, the genetics. I'll say it again. I've never had anybody come to me. And the, the parent did nothing, and the other parent did nothing, and the kid became a world class athlete. I've, I've just never seen it in my sport. There's some. Can you repeat that, folks? If you so, some people ask me and they say, "Why do you bring somebody who's a tennis coach?" We never talk tennis here. I'm a parent, and I only bring people here to my show that I'm interested in, not you're interested in. This is called the PBD podcast because I want to learn on how to become a full, complete package, better human being, and a leader, okay? Listen to what he just said. I judge myself kind of like people ask me, oh, my God, Pat, you're so impressive. I'm like, dude, you don't know my dad. You you give me way too much credit. My dad raised the damn standards on work ethic, and if you say you're going to do something, you do it in honesty and all this stuff, I get way too much credit. You should give more credit to my dad. 80% of the credit should be to my dad on how he raised me. The, how we challenged me, how it was never enough. It was so freaking annoying sometimes, yeah. right? And then you, and, and, and obviously dad and mom, mom played a different role, role as well. But it's such an important dynamic on what you just said. Can you repeat that sentence one more time? You've never seen a... 
No, I've never seen someone become a world-class player, okay, in, in my sport, that the mom or dad didn't do something in sports, you know, with the genetics, like whether they played high-level college or yeah. high school or maybe the family tree. It could be a grandfather who so was an Olympic powerful. sprinter or, you know, a Russian who was a, a swimmer. So there has to be something. I've never seen it ever, okay? But you're and, saying physically genetics. Are you also saying physically. how they no, interact physic- with their no, child? physically. Now, hmm. the mental part, yeah. okay? Because uh, remember, if they're with Rick Macy or whoever, they're with me X amount of time a day. The rest of the time, when you go home and close that door, you're with family. You don't know what's percolating. You don't know what life lessons are going into that kid's head, how they're, how they're wired. You know, it's, it's, it's major league. To me, it's the most important. That's why, once again, you asked me about American tennis. And listen, I'm not throwing a net out there over the whole country or everybody. You're always going to have those flyers. But at the end of the day, the Eastern Europeans, you got people, they're rougher, they're tougher. It's like when I saw Serena, she was like a little pit bull. Once she got a hold of you, she wasn't going to let go. And I just said, I got to get this kid strokes and a serve. And so <laughs> that, that's, that's, you know, and that's half the battle. How you are going to handle, yeah. you know, and, and how you're going to compete? And you can teach that and nurture it, yeah. and I do that. Yeah. But it's hard yeah. to rewire things that have been put in these kids' head. So, so you know how uh, 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 the the story of uh, what's that one movie with Russell Crowe, The Beautiful Mind, where you go into that one place yeah, that he has, mind. and it's got all these formulas. Like, what the hell is in this guy's mind? What does he think about? Or even Greg Kading, who found who killed Tupac and Big and he's got this whole report of names there. In even the American gangster, where there's just one scene where it's like, who is the drug dealer behind everything? And you know, it's Denzel Washington. It's typically when you see like somebody, you know, performing at a high level, somebody in that lineage raised the standards, was tough, was a son of a bitch, was difficult, was challenging, nothing was ever enough. And pop up, like when Agassiz tells a story with my dad, nothing was ever enough. I don't know if you know his story, yeah, a different I, story I as well. It's almost like, yeah, buddy, but you would have never married Graf if that wasn't your dad. You would have never met her. You would have never been a champion if it if I wasn't. I totally get it. Frustrating. Totally get it. I get that. Fully understand it. But there, there, it's almost like you know, Mike. Mike talked about it in the last dance where he says, when you're going through it, it's so difficult. When my dad was, pre- this is what my, uh, Michael says in the last dance. Do you remember that one scene when he says? You know, hey, Michael, why don't you go play outside? You know what? You know, yeah, you're just not. Let, let me and your brother do what they're doing. He says, in that moment, it drove me. It was so difficult to go through it. But he made it through, and look what level of a champion he became. He becomes mentally and emotionally tough to be able to handle all this pressure. So I don't know. I think the part that you talk about that people are raising more soft people today and parents is like, oh my gosh, you okay? Oh my gosh, you okay? Oh my gosh, you okay? I don't know a lot of, oh my gosh, you're okay growing up. Uh, uh, you know, as a kid. So listen, some people today will call that terrible parenting. Rick, how dare you say such a thing? You're not empathetic. You're not compassionate. You don't understand what it is. You know, so all this stuff that you talk about, but the, the, the percentage of making it to the top level, take Elon Musk's dad away, and his dad doesn't say what he says to him. Does Elon Musk become who he is today? I don't know about that. Do you have another Tiger Woods ever? Tiger Woods won the 2007 U.S. Open with a broken knee. Unbelievable. That's a, that's a rare specimen mm-hmm. right there with his dad. Did you watch his documentary? Well, and he, Yeah, and he said Phil Mickelson is a better player than he is, right? But he didn't have the worth, work ethic that, that Earl Woods killer instilled in instinct. Tiger Woods. That killer instinct. Did you watch the documentary? Parts of it. Have you watched the documentary? Like half of it. I do. I highly recommend you watch the whole thing. Did you? Did you get? No, a I did not. I'm telling you guys. I so here's the mistake I made. One night I started watching at 10:30, and it's three hours. I said I'm going to watch it today, and I'm going to finish the next three nights. I stayed up to two o'clock in the morning. I watched part one and part two. It's that ridiculous. That's why I'm a big fan mm-hmm. of Tiger. I mean, even all the stuff that he has, I'm just a fan of Tiger. I'm a fan of people that are willing to tolerate that much pain. Yeah. It is so difficult to become a Williams. Yeah. It is yeah. so difficult to win at that level. So well, Pat, let me ask you, yeah. because you started the conversation or this question with, you know, our kids conditioned these days and the phobia these days. And, and obviously you transitioned to you wouldn't be who you were without what Zero. your dad. Did, Zero. Right. And he's a coach. If God would have chosen somebody else as my dad. You, so you don't know who I am. My question to you is then, Pat, as a father, you told yeah. the story a couple podcasts ago about 
you went up to I think Dylan's coach and you were like, no, you could be hard on him. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, you told that story. Yeah. You know, but you're seeing what kids are dealing with these days. Everything that Rick just said yeah. about social media and you know the phobias. How are you taking this information and becoming a better dad to your kids in today's generation? So he made a very good point in sales. I made a mistake early on of driving everybody the same way because I drove this one guy this one way and it worked with him. And I said, this is going to work with everybody. He hated it. She couldn't handle it. He quit. I'm like, what happened? How come you can't be like this person? Well, they're different personalities. You can't drive everybody the same way, right? One needs more encouragement. The other one needs to say, well, I think that guy's uh, woke up an hour before you and made 100 more calls than you. That worked with him, hmm. but it discouraged this one. Then the other one was good with the selfish desires. He wants the big house, the accolades, the fame, all that stuff. But this other one could give a shit about all that stuff. This one wants to do it for mom and dad to make them proud. That other person loves America and his country. He wants to do something to give back to the country that gave him his freedom. And this other guy's from El Salvador. He loves his country, but he came here. He can't stand the fact that what happened to El Salvador, he wants to make money to one day go back and be in office in El Salvador. That person's driven in a different way. So not everybody's driven the same way. So with my kids, I asked them a question earlier about different ways of coaching. Like what your kids need at the, when they're younger is just for them to love the game. Then the next phase is what your kids need at this age is more fundamentals, right? Like learning, like, you know, perfect practice makes perfect, not practice makes perfect. They have to add the mm -hmm. perfect practice makes perfect. Okay, so now they need to learn the fundamentals the right way. Like I'm not teaching Tico how to throw the ball. I'm the wrong guy to teach you how to throw the ball. <laughs> you can teach him how to throw the ball better than I can teach him how to throw the ball, right? Because you're an athlete. I was not, right? So now it's getting the fundamental people around them and to also like the game. A little bit of competition, a little bit of pressure. Then the real pressure is showing up when you're getting at the 10 to 14 age. You're kind of seeing a little bit. Can they handle it or not? You need a little bit more support, all this stuff to watch them. I don't know. I just watch to see we're all different. And with the kids yesterday, we're playing baseball outside. Dylan wants to go 45 more minutes. Let me hit five more balls. Let me hit five more balls. Let me hit five more. That, no, no, that wasn't long enough. Five more. I'm like, at this point, I'm, we missed church yesterday. We missed church yesterday because of Dylan. Well, I'm disappointed. Man. So I'm like, five more church. balls. I know I missed you. At the, you were but doing you, the, want, the, you the, want that passion. I mean, that's mm -hmm. gold right there. You don't, you're not pushing. No. That's from within. Yeah. When but, my oldest, you, but my oldest said, Daddy, I want to go inside and draw uh, more uh, movie characters. See you later. But the point is, his see you later is Hollywood and movies. Storytelling. Yeah. Hmm. It's not baseball. So I'm trying to, as a parent, like your daughters, they don't want to play tennis, but they crush it in gymnastics. It's that you not getting in the way of what is their strength. And yet still having to teach them mental and emotional toughness no matter what game they play. So my son's like, I said, I don't like baseball. Why don't you like baseball? He had one very bad moment in baseball. It's private between him and I. And uh, like, so I whispered to him. I said, come here. Is that why? And he kind of looks away. So that's why, isn't it? Because that one moment? Yeah. I said, that's between you and I. He says, but I don't like baseball. I said, do you not like baseball? Do you not like it? Because it links to a painful moment. I said, what are you going to do when you make a movie one day and everybody says it's a terrible movie? How are you going to handle that? Good point. What are you going to do? You think this thing is a baseball thing? This is a life thing, baby. This is everything we do. We do podcasts. It's just the shittiest podcast ever. Then the next podcast. This is the best podcast ever. Then the next podcast. You guys suck. Two podcasts later. This is the greatest. They're going to be the biggest. <laughs> it, like, it's such a bipolar thing mm -hmm. that you got to be able to manage it. No, you got to be able to. You got to be able to. Really? Really? Of course. That, that parents need to be more, more than anything psychiatrists, not yeah. coaches, right? Yeah, psychologists. They psychologists. Yeah. But let me let me just go back to something you said earlier about the the coaching parks. I think this is important. Okay, I can have a kid who's dead tired, okay, and they they can't go anymore. And I might say, okay, we're gonna do a twenty ball suicide where I just run them side to side, okay, and they get to eighteen and they just can't go anymore. And all of a sudden, I say, twenty dollars, you get this ball. And let me tell you something. There's turbo inside the kid that I've never seen before. Or if I say, I'll give you a hoodie, like the one I have on. Or uh, you get a Gatorade. Or I'll give you five bucks. Or water. Capitalism. Okay, here's what happens. When there's grades or there's rewards, I don't care how tired you are, you could be throwing up. Okay, I always have the quote, one more, one more. As in W-O-N. Ah. Okay, okay. And this is what I do with everybody, wow. okay? I get them to push boundaries, challenge their limits, not limit their challenges. And so it's amazing. 
the water ball, if I say water ball, okay, out of nowhere, you got like Usain Bolt. You know, you just got this lightning. The kid's like dragon, whatever, because the mind controls the body, okay? And, you know, I talked to him about Navy SEALs. I talked to him about all these type things, and I give situation. I love that. When I say water ball, all the parents, like, they just laugh because 98% of the kids, all of a sudden it's like, they just run like you have no idea. Where before, they're mm-hmm. letting the mind control yeah. the body. Or yeah. if I put kids together, and we pl- they could be dead tired, and we play tag in an area, okay? All of a sudden, they're not tired anymore. They're shaking and baking. They're juking. They're bobbing. They're weaving. They're running all over the place, even though they're dead tired because of one word, fun. When it's mm. fun, okay, you are not tired anymore, whether it's business, whether – I'm just telling you, and this is how it comes across in the movie. So do I do things differently? I feel the temperature, okay, and I react accordingly because I keep balls and strikes on every lesson. You got to get better or you're getting worse. Last, uh, uh, what's your opinion on Nick's style of leadership? Nick Boletari? Yeah. Nick and I are pretty good friends. You know, we go way back. Um it's, it's a very different situation with Nick. Early on, he was the first though, Mo- Mohicans. He put that thing together in Bradington. He was the first one to really do an academy where he got guys together. He just figured, put them together, combat, and you know, put people together that were living in New York or Wisconsin or Michigan, bring them to Florida, battle it out, and you'll get better. Nick was a great motivator. He'd give you the shirt off his back. Okay, then when it became, I think, technically or biomechanically, he was always very limited, not because he wasn't a good player or anything, uh, but when it becomes easy and then IMG gets involved, you don't really continue your education. But he had that IMG machine, you know, pumping Boletari's name out for 30 years, okay? But what Nick has done for uh, the game of tennis um, and the academy business, I think – is amazing, but I, I very seldom have been on a court with him. Just like if someone would ask, well, how does Rick Macy coach? What they should do, get on the court with me. I'll be there at six tomorrow morning, and they can hang with me for six hours, and they'll have a different understanding than what they see on Instagram, of YouTube. Even though I got the top selling videos in the country, okay, they there's a lot of meat on the bone. I help a lot of people for free, but once live and in color and you can interact and you can see all the subtle nuances of how things are done, why to say it, when to say it, how to say it. There's a whole art to this and and that's coaching. And so when you went to Saban and the Dolphins, sure, you need the goods or you need the thoroughbred to win the Derby, but also you got to relate. You got to know how to relate to people. And that's what great coaches do. So it doesn't matter who's on the other side of the net. Uh, I can get them to do more than what they ever thought they could do. I love that. By the way, did you see the recent story of, uh, and we'll do this last one and wrap up, is uh, Djokovic, uh, 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 is that the one or no? Novak yes. Djokovic. No, Novak Djokovic slams Wimbledon ban on Russian tennis players as crazy and says political. Politics should be out of uh, sports. Uh, let me read this story. Uh, it says, parallels between the Ukraine war and the Kosovo war in the late 90s, which took place when he was a child. He said, I will always condemn war. I will never support war. Uh, Being myself a child of war, I know how much emotional trauma it leaves. In Serbia, we all know what happened in 1999. In the Balkans, we have had many wars in recent history. However, I cannot support the decision of Wimbledon. I think it's crazy when politics interferes with sports. The result is not good. What do you think about what he said? I totally agree with the joker. He'll probably go down uh, until Alcaraz catches fire, Alcatraz, yeah, um, as the greatest player ever to hold a tennis racket when it's all said and done because he has a lot left in the tank. But I totally agree with him. Um, that shouldn't have anything to do with it. You know, it has nothing to do with it. Um, Wimbledon's always been a little different. Um, if anything, they should give, you know, the $30 million they got from an insurance policy they had for the pandemic. By the way, you probably didn't know that. They got $30 million when they didn't do Wimbledon because they had it in the clause. If there was a pandemic, they get 30 mil. Hmm. And they didn't have the tournament, and they got 30 mil that year. Who did? Wimbledon. They had it in insurance policy back in the early 2000s. Is this public info? Yeah. 
You know, so they get thirty million from who exactly? The insurance company. Hmm. If they had to cancel it because of a pandemic, which who would put that in an insurance? The day you think you have a pandemic, it's not going to happen. That's actually great planning by Wimbledon. Great planning. But what I'm saying, they should give some cheddar to Ukraine instead of banning Russian tennis players. I think I agree with the Joker. I think it's like insane and it's unfortunate. um, Because holy shit, do you know what the actual number is? One hundred and forty-one million dollars. Look what? at that right there. Yeah, Forbes. Wimbledon's organizer set for $141 million payout after taking out pandemic insurance. You know what the wow. premium is per year? You know what the premium is per year? Probably a million bucks. $2 million bucks. per yeah, year. Million. Look at that. $2 million per year. Yeah. Got him $141 so million. Dollars. Wimbledon was rooting for a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They were okay with the it. leader in the clubhouse, the yeah. pandemic. But I agree with the Joker. I just feel it's unfortunate. I hope other uh, tournaments don't do the same thing because the players. I mean, tennis is a tough sport. You got to pay your own expenses. It's global. Yeah. It's not like NBA. Their stuff's not guaranteed. It's very expensive, and I think to deprive them of that opportunity is unfortunate. Well, listen, uh, I, I hope the audience has enjoyed this as much as I've enjoyed it. Yeah, This was awesome. I'm so glad we were able to do this. Rick, uh, you're a qualified badass. I'm so glad we had <laughs> you on. And not only that, but you're a cool sport, great sport, telling cool stories. Uh, learned a I, lot, a lot listening you, to you. You got two more? You got two more minutes? I got Go a, for a it. Serena story. Tell me. Okay. The people, people love this. I told this, and it went viral. Okay, we're on the court. Serena is 11 years old. It's July, okay, 110 degrees. A lizard can't even go across the court without getting cooked, okay? <laughs> so it's, and Venus is on one court. Yeah. Serena's on another, always side by side. And I told Serena, you got to move your feet. And she looks at me, and you know that look. You've seen it at the U.S. Open. She goes, why? I said, you say you want to be number one. She goes, now she's 11, Okay, she goes, I will be number one. I said, well, how do I get you to move your feet? She goes, Rick, I'm really hungry. Can you have Scott go to the snack machine? I want some hot curly fries, a Snickers bar, a Pepsi. And on the way to work today, daddy drove by a stand and they were selling Green Day T-shirts. Can you have Scott get a Green Day T-shirt? And I said, wait a minute. If I get you the Snickers bar, the curly fries, the Pepsi, Scott gets the Green Day T-shirt. Will you move your feet? She goes, Rick. You see that tall, skinny girl over there? She's pointing to Venus because Venus was like that. I'll make her look slower than molasses. So I go, Scott, go to the snack machine, get the hot curly fries, Snickers bar, the Pepsi. Tomorrow on the way to work on Linton Boulevard, get the Green Day T-shirt. So he brings all the goodies. Serena goes under the canopy, has her snack, goes back on the court for one hour straight. She's sitting cross-court and down the line with a guy like 450 in the world. They had hitting partners sweats pouring off this little girl like Niagara Falls. No water break. An hour straight, just going berserk. One hour straight. I'm on the other court now with uh, Venus. She goes, hey, Rick, it's 3.15. I'm done, and you better have that Green Day T-shirt here in the morning. <laughs> now, and, that, you gotta, and I told her that because you got to remember, she's, yeah. she's a mother now. And when I told her some of these stories at the after party, she's literally crying. Okay, on the ground, because she can relate. I mean, she wasn't as mature as Venus. That's why she turned pro at 16 and Venus 14. But that's a great Serena story. But at the end of the day, like you asked me earlier about coaching, she was in the tank. She was already played four hours. I got the best out of her. I won. She won. Richard won. And the rest is history. I love that. That's and that, the power of Green Day, baby. There you go, That's Green Day. <laughs> the power of, I read a book called Parental Capacity, and it said if you want to win at the highest level for your kids, if you want your kids to win at the highest level, you need the right supporting cast around you, coaches, teachers, professors, tutors, uncles. You need the right people around that keep challenging and lifting your kids up. The yeah. right ones can help Great that man. kid become somebody. And obviously you played a very, very big role in what these Williams sisters yeah. did. And uh, it's great to be part of history. It's great to have a movie be done. And a guy like John Bernthal, one of my favorite actors, play you. That's like a dream come true, man. It's exciting stuff there to have you on. So having said that, tomorrow we have who? We have a Diamond Dallas page. Tomorrow and then Thursday we have 
Paul Manafort. That should be very interesting right there, what that's going to be like. Having oh, yeah. said that, brother, it was great having you on, Rick. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for having me. Really yes, no, I, may, I may take a uh, lesson with you, man, and yeah. see what you got with this <laughs> one hour. I say we do it. I we say we it. record it, and you let's see. Let's play a little match, and let's see what Rick can teach us. I'll let you know. That would be hilarious. But wait a minute. We'll do it, and we'll video, and I'll let you know where you're at technically, genetically, strategically, and maybe at the end I might say we have to take up golf. But I don't know. You get a deal. I say we do it. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye.